Okay, so I will probably try to keep it a bit shorter then. Uh, yes, as Celia said, I would like to talk about how to do in human uh, interaction in virtual environments using Unity. I will get back to later to why to use Unity, but basically what I wanted to start at the beginning, uh, this is really a talk about how to do things when you have somewhat realistic expectation on what the result can be in a realistic budget. So if there's a lead character artist from Naughty Dog or somebody like in the audience, you might want to leave before your eyes start bleeding. If not, then let's go on the tour. Uh, why am I even doing this? Uh, I'm currently working at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, developing our own product for psychotherapy in virtual reality. Uh, what we are focusing on mainly at the moment is so-called social adversity disorder, so social avoidance, communication avoidance. Uh, it's a very prevalent issue in, within the society. Uh, for that task, we need or we are trying to recreate a treatment which is normally quite expensive and logistically difficult in the virtual reality. And as such, we are developing an application that needs to be as close to reality and as uh, little gamey or as easy to understand for non-games people as possible. Uh, the reason why we are using Unity for that is that it's basically the only kind of license we can box through our financial departments. If, if the, uh, our financial department for the Helmholtz Institution hears something like revenue share, then they are just going bananas. So Unity, if it's like pay once a year license, was the pretty much only option. Otherwise, I would say that Unity is not the best engine when you are trying to create realistic graphics. But I do believe that there is quite a few people who will find themselves in a similar situation. So maybe this could be talk for them. So task is let's create a believable communicating virtual human being. Uh, let's start. Uh, or sorry. Uh, just as, as an example, this is a this is a scenario that we are having. So a classroom speech, basically our patients then need to give a speech to a classroom in environment like this. This is a small one for a bit more constrained, bit more calming environment. You can see some sort of therapist interface on the top of that. And this is kind of the, the target or this is a, the level we are working at. Uh, so. Uh, flow of what I'm going to do is how to create a virtual character, how to put it in Unity, how to attempt to give it as real life look as possible and how to create an interaction with the user. I'm not going to be talking about the psychological side at all today, so it's, it's going to be very technical. So yeah, let's start. Uh, as, a, as a creation tool, we picked Adobe Fuse because we are having Adobe licenses from the get-go anyway. Uh, the good thing about creating realistic characters is that unlike for computer games or when you have to create a, I don't know, guy in an armor with a sword or a dragon or whatnot, uh, we are limiting ourselves only to normal human beings, normal clothing, and there are actually character generator tools like Adobe Fuse that can just pretty much build a character from uh, from components. So you don't have to have like a big 3D uh, art, 3D modeling department. Uh, I started with my guy here, just basic components, uh, the physique. Then let's do some uh, changes on him. So it's not super generic. So he has a bit of a character that, that looks a bit more realistic. Uh, a human representation, but maybe not so pleasing to eye anymore. So let's put some clothes on. So this is a very nice part of basically using these generator softwares uh, that you can even put your own clothes in and uh, their algorithms will retarget the clothes size to match the character uh, the procedural properties. So you can generate relatively big amount of variable characters without the need of creating any sort of retopology for the book close or something like that. This is all done automatically. And yeah, in the end, to give it a bit more 
a bit more distinct look. Let's put the guy in black, uh, my favorite closing color. And we are pretty much set. So this would be our modeling process. Uh, we spent 20, 30 minutes. Uh, second part that's usually complicated in 3D game development is rigging and skinning. Again, because this is a somehow integrated workflow, Adobe is providing the Mixamo service which creates the bone structure and facial shapes uh, automatically for your pre-generated character. So we can just upload, uh, we get a guy with bones and everything, um, we can make him dance. Then we take the guy, put him in Unity. Uh, when you start, you get this completely non-creepy looking uh, import. So this needs to be fixed uh, super quick. Uh, after applying standard shaders, uh, we get something like this. So this is a bit of a no-go. Unfortunately, the standard shaders in Unity, in Unity will not get very nice or very good looking human beings. Two huge issues. Uh, one is basically the, the shaders are not really set to work very well on organic materials. Second, there are some lighting issues. So if, if you put your characters in just like that, you will always have uh, glowing nose holes, which seems to upset our patients for a reason. Uh, so let, let's start fixing that. Uh, by applying some sort of uh, shader that's designed for skin, uh, we can avoid these issues. So what I get here is the subscase, no, subsurface scattering effect that mimics the bending of light underneath the skin. So you get like all these nice effects, uh, like semi-translucent ears. Uh, you get basically all, all the thin areas of face will get bit more realistic color. Uh, you get some dis better distribution of close and spectacularity. So uh, now only the parts that you would kind of expect to be shiny are shiny. And finally, you can con uh, you, what you need to do is some control of uh, ambience occlusion suppression of light. So you don't get these lighting nose holes uh, effect anymore. This is something you have to go to the market for, but uh, most of the packages or most of the tools I will be talking about today are usually relatively financially uh, reachable. So I think this shader costs like 20 euros. Uh, then second point is eyes. Uh, again, can't really be done very well with standard shader, but uh, if you look for some better shader package, you can get uh, relatively nice eyes by including uh, normal effects like water surface or diffusion scattering that give the eyes the more, uh, more of this effect of basically having this transparent layer on top of, uh, yeah, on top of uh, your eye surface and also iris uh, diffusion. Uh, lastly, and that's the biggest issue uh, for the face, that's hair. Uh, you can try to basically fix your hair with shaders, but it's always going to be a big issue. One of the, one of the, base, one of the biggest issues that we are encountering is basically culling of the faces from inside, so you don't, uh, it's visible on the side that you don't really see the hair from underneath. Uh, if you try to do uh, two-sided blending, I'm not sure how much is visible here, but what you kind of get is an helmet effect. It looks that you're not really having real hair, that you're having helmets instead. I was actually looking through how Unit is doing it for their flagship project, so for the Adam demo in uh, 2017 and for the Blacksmith demo in uh, version 5. And for the blacksmith demo, they just put the hair so close to the face that you don't really see them from underneath, but otherwise they would be having this effect as well. And for the Adam demo, they just decided, okay, let's do bold characters only. So that, that's one way to go about, but for us it would be very impractical to have only bold characters. Uh, so what we decided to go with is basically uh, GPU computed physical hair, so now uh, I re 
recreated the hair completely for this character using, again, a package that we had to pay like 50, 60 bucks for. Uh, this is more computational demanding, but basically gives you pretty much the best effect. Still, you have some problems like absence of shade. Oh, sorry. It's the laser pointer is not really visible, right? No, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, absence of proper shadows uh, alongside the uh, forehead. We didn't really figure out a way how, good way how to fire around that. Uh, unfortunately, the really professional tools like uh, NVIDIA Hairworks are not available in Unity at, at the moment. There was an attempt to bring the package in, but Un uh, NVIDIA decided not to, or to decline support for that package. So uh, I'm afraid this is as good as you get. If somebody has a better workflow, I would be very happy to talk to you afterwards. Okay, we have a character. Uh, the clothes are then ver very easy. You can finalize that using the standard utility shaders. And now we can start making the character a bit live. So first absolutely important thing is your human needs to blink. Uh, if you have a bunch of people sitting in a classroom and no, but none of them is blinking and they are looking at you, it's so creepy. It's like I would get social phobia from that. Uh, so, good start is just to uh, put some or look for some packages that uh, control the facial animation automatically. And it's completely okay to have a random eye movement, random blinking. Uh, it looks super realistically. It basically looks like when you are actually having a normal person in an, in an audience. And what's a good thing is that since, uh, the fa since the Adobe Fuse created the blind shapes for us, uh, these packages then tend to know how to work with these. So it's really drag and drop. You don't have to define the information of how to, uh, what actually does it mean in the term of facial geometry to blink. It just works out of the box. Uh, next thing, uh, speech. For speech, uh, like professional solution would be to record all the facial animations individually. Uh, that for us would be too much of a hassle, unfortunately. So we looked into uh, lip syncing solutions that basically decode the voice track and create uh, facial shapes out of that or create a movement of mouth out of that. Uh, in this particular package, you can also accompany it with uh, additional facial expressions like uh, looking serious, looking depressed, etc. So in the end, uh, you will basically get your character speaking, making faces. Uh, seems to work reasonably well towards the expectations of the user. And last thing uh, from just the non-interactive part is whole body motion. Unfortunately, this is the only part where I really don't know of like a cheap solution. Uh, we ended up getting a motion capture suit and also partially using a Vicom, Vicom motion capture solution. Good thing is that the new motion capture solution since like a five years ago uh, mostly cost less than 2,000 euros a piece. I know that sometimes it can still be a lot of money. But there are at least three or four solutions that basically can be obtained for this amount of money. And I think that like, actually trying to do in bigger project all the animations by hand than without motion capture is just not achievable. So for us, it was a reasonable investment. We bought a perception, neuro su uh, perception neuron suit, which not only works uh, rather well, it's untethered, but also gives you this nice 980s looking bandana around your head. Uh, it's pretty straightforward recording. It even has a Unity package for streaming directly, but basically the workflow is then really just hit record, you get your bone animation, you drag and drop it in Unity, your character is moving, and that's pretty much how, how we go about uh, creating the individual character behavior. Then when it comes to the interaction, uh, mainly in VR, a bit of a problem is that you cannot really block your character or your player. So 
if you put a wall in VR and the wall is in the walking area of the user, they will just walk through the wall because like, you cannot physically prohibit them from walking around. So to kind of react to the behavior of the user, we are using, the, we are using inverse kinematics to retarget the position of head, uh, the way the audience is looking when the speaker moves around. And this, this uh, combines itself rather well with uh, pre-built animation. So you can pretty much have reasonable animation of, I don't know, sitting in an audience, giving a speech, uh, and combine it with the inverse kinematics to make sure that the person in the audience is still maintaining the focus on the speaker. Uh, but it also needs a bit of a smart programming, smart behavior, because again, if, if we get behaviors like all people in the audience are focusing on the speaker, uh, the speaker tends to find out like something is wrong. It, uh, basically, the, the feeling of realism comes from the randomness and variety. And that would be pretty much all from me. Uh, if there are some questions, I would be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I uh, thought about some other topics that I feel would not fit into the discussion. But if you would be interested in about how to do, how do we do procedural cloth uh, behavior of physical objects or custom clothing for our characters, or what are some other tools except for fuse or for additional motion capture, I'm, uh, I will be happy to answer. Does it work? Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Adam Forns. Um, is there a question in the audience? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, which kind of hardware did you use for record yourself uh, in order to make the animations? Uh, sorry, once again, please, uh, which hardware for? What's the hardware that you use to, to record yourself in order to, to put it on, on Unity? The trackers that, 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 that we have seen there in, in, the, in the image. I mean, how can you record yourself in order to, to put these movements into, into, into the Unity charger? Uh, I'm not sure completely if I understand. For motion capture, uh, we use the perception neuron uh, suit. But is, is that the question? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So perception neuron, it's uh, basically a magnetic field accelerometer based device. So it doesn't use visual uh, cues. It just calibrates its position and then using uh, accelerometers, magnetometers and gyroscopes, it just computes the change of position which is for us very, uh, very nice because we then want to record the behavior like sitting behind the table and usually you have problem with uh, reflective markers that if you put the table over something or if you have like reading newspaper animation, you would obfuscate the markers. So we basically picked this solution. Secondary reason was that this one actually does a very good animation of hands and usually you need to combine then your marker solution with some sort of uh, additional hand tracking solution like motion uh, mocap glove or uh, capture glove, I think it's called, and we get it all in one go. Like so, we get the whole body plus the hands in one sitting, and we do the audio recording at the same time as well. So, in the end, everything is pretty much synchronized from the start. Okay, thank you so much, Adam.